Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your marriage without your husband's conscious effort so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if it seems completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm sharing four steps to fight for your marriage when you're separated. My guest, Izzy, was devastated about her husband's emotional affair and addiction to porn. He wanted to separate and then divorce after she returned to work from maternity leave. Then Izzy made a big change and things are dramatically different at her house. She and her husband feel like a team and their physical intimacy is better than ever. She's going to tell us what she did so you can do it too. That's coming up. But first, let's talk about the four steps to fight for your marriage when you're separated. If you've ever been separated, I don't need to tell you what a stressful, heartbreaking experience it is. It's also so awkward and embarrassing to have to explain to everybody what's going on. You don't want their pity or for the kids to get scared and start asking really hard questions. You just want to fix what's broken and get back on track already. Along those lines, I want to share a four-step game plan that students who have stood for their marriage used to make their marriage last and thrive after a separation. Even if he said he's never coming back, it can be done. And many students on our campus have done it. And if you're committed and courageous, you can do it too. Here's how. Number one, forget your troubles. Come on, get happy. The first step is the most counterintuitive, but it's also indispensable. And the irony, right? I mean, while you're in the most agonizing emotional pain of your entire life, the challenge in front of you is to get really happy. But why? Well, when my marriage almost ended, I learned the hard way that only happy people have happy relationships. <laughs> I thought it was the other way where my happy relationship and loving husband would make me feel happy. Instead, I sucked all the life out of our marriage by getting progressively more unhappy and then staying stuck there waiting for my husband to make me happy. And that was excruciating for him because he couldn't. He couldn't make me happy. He had an unhappy wife, couldn't please her, couldn't make her laugh or even smile. Never mind that it was also excruciating for me to be miserable. The solution for both of us was to somehow, some way, get happy, to find things that delighted me and do them, even if, especially if they were frivolous, like playing volleyball and word games on my phone and listening to a funny podcast. That led to smiling and then laughing and then to being pleasable. Suddenly, I wasn't such a downer to be around anymore because I remembered who I am. I'm the girl of fun and light. And you have that inner just want to have fun girl and you too. If you haven't seen her in a while, this is the time to ask yourself whether tap dancing in the living room or going to the forest or watching a comedy would light her up. This step of getting happy may seem pointless and too hard to do right now, and that's understandable. There's a big hole in your world right now, and the way to patch that hole, in my experience, is with smiles, laughing, singing, and dancing. Number two is the smile campaign. The smile campaign. Once you've found your way to being happy again, your face will surely show it. That means you'll be smiling all the time at everyone you see, especially your husband. And okay, maybe you don't see him that much. That's okay. You, you can practice your megawatt smile for when you do see him by smiling at everyone else, your kids, store clerks, bank tellers, colleagues, uh, your other family members. This will demonstrate that the scourge of unhappiness you were previously suffering from has been cured. It will also let him know that you're happy to see him. Isn't that true? I mean, of course, you'll be even happier when he comes home and declares that he loves you forever and says he'll never leave again. You'll smile really big then, right? Well, the road to that happy ending 
is paved with smiles. He might even smile back or try to make you laugh. Maybe you'll start laughing together, which is exactly what happy couples do. Number three, restore emotional safety. One of the things that made it feel so good to be together when you fell in love was that you both thought so highly of each other. You weren't focused on his shortcomings and he wasn't focused on yours. So it was safe to dream big and talk freely without worrying that you'd get hurt. Of course, you did get hurt. And so did he. You're both so hurt. So it can feel hard to restore that emotional safety now that it's been shattered into a million little pieces. But a great way to start restoring emotional safety is by owning your part in the breakdown. And that might seem crazy if he's the one who separated and you didn't even want that. You may feel he's the one who should be apologizing. I remember feeling the same way. And it felt so unfamiliar to travel the high road of being accountable for my small, tiny, insignificant part in the breakdown. But once I did, I felt empowered. I was no longer a victim because I was choosing to take responsibility for my part of the dances. So some awful things were done, and I'm the one that did them. Some mean things were said, and yeah, that was me that said them. That accountability went a long way toward restoring emotional safety, which helped resurrect our original connection. It also made me feel really good about myself, a lot better than the old victim me ever felt. Number four, set your intention. If you and your husband are separated, you might think you're not the one who gets to say what happens next with the marriage, whether it survives. But I wouldn't be so sure because one of the ways I see wives fix their marriages from separation and make them better than ever is by asking herself what her intentions are for the marriage. It may seem obvious to you, like, of course you want your marriage, which is why you're listening to this podcast right now. You're fighting for your marriage, which I admire very much because marriages are so important. In our Ridiculously Happy Wife and Diamond programs, We have a very popular training about talking to your future self one year from now. It's about envisioning what your life is like and finding out how everything went your way. And one of the things I love about this training is that women often share with me how spooky it is that when they got their miracle in their marriage, it was exactly what they had envisioned from doing this training. It's very like do 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 twilight zone. They were dancing together on a trip or expecting a baby or had moved to a new home, just like she imagined when she talked to her future self. So it's worth asking yourself, what is your vision for the future of your marriage? As Kermit the Frog sang, life's like a movie, write your own ending, keep believing, keep pretending. How would you show up today differently? If you knew for sure that your movie had a happy ending, would you be happier? Would you smile more? Would you be more accountable for your part of the breakdown? Because that's what I see women do who fight for their marriages and win. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest Izzy was devastated about her husband's emotional affair and addiction to porn. He wanted to separate and then divorce after she returned to work from maternity leave. 
Then Izzy made a big change and things are dramatically different at her house. Today, she and her husband feel like a team and their physical intimacy is better than ever. She's going to tell us what she did so you can do it too. Izzy, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very um, honored to be on the show. Great to hear. Well, Let's start from the bad old days. What was happening in your marriage? Yeah, so really in the beginning, we had been together since we were um, in high school. So we had a very long relationship, 10 years. Um, and, and, you know, I, I look back now and I see a lot of problems, but really at the time I minimized a lot of our things that we had problems with. So um, in high school, there was a borderline I guess you could call emotional affair, which set me off for the trajectory of our whole relationship. Um, and it caused to start controlling and just being very alert of what was going on in our relationship and having a lot of fear. Um, we didn't get married until seven years of dating. And even that felt like I always was asking when we were going to get married and saying, oh, this person got married. What about us? We should get married. All of those things that a lot of people tend to do. Um, And he just kept saying he wasn't ready. And I I really didn't know why. Um, So it really kind of came to a head um, right when I got pregnant. So um, I had gotten pregnant. We were actually trying. So it wasn't a surprise pregnancy or anything. Um, But I just started noticing his behavior kind of shift. And I really did not understand why at the time. Where I just, when you have those like gut feelings that something is going wrong, I had one of those. And so I told him that I think there's something up and I need you to tell me what's going on. Um, And we were going back and forth. And then he told me um, that he had relapsed from five months of sobriety with his porn addiction. Um, That, although was true, was not really what was going on. I later found out, but I was devastated um, because I had told him, I said, I can handle the porn. I can't handle is you lying to me. And I tell him that every time. And that was kind of where we broke down a bit because he told me that he didn't think he could ever be honest with me, um, which really hurt. And I, I didn't understand why. To me, I was like, what do you mean you can't be honest with me? And at the time, I didn't understand that. But now I'm understanding that what that meant was he didn't feel safe to be vulnerable with me because of how controlling and how explosive in our arguments about the porn addiction. So it kept getting worse and worse. Um, and things just kept getting said that were pretty horrible. So he started saying stuff like, oh, I forgot to say at that time when I found out about the relapse, I had told him to get out. Um, and I was really mad. I gave him (laughs) the Bible and a rosary and I was like, get out. And he did not leave. He actually stayed. And, uh, that was just a sign in itself that I knew he would want to work, but it just kept from that moment. So he started saying things like he never really wanted to get married, that he was not attracted to me and he never was attracted to me. Yeah. He said stuff like he thought he was in love with me when he got married, but he didn't actually know what love was. And, um, that's not what we have. Um, so it's just a lot of different things, a lot of things about my body. Um, and to be fair with that point, like I had gained um, like 40 pounds over three months when we first got married, because, um, that's when I first found out about the porn addiction after moving across the country to a new place. Um, and I didn't know how to cope with my emotions and, um, what I had gotten myself into is what I thought. Um, and even at that point, right when that was probably a month into our marriage, I had even said, this is annulment worthy. So I think part of that too. He had that in the back of his mind that we kind of have an out within our religion. Um, and it just kept getting worse and worse. He was lying to me at 
the worst part, it was actually um, after I had um, our baby, I ended up in the hospital and I was, I had a really healthy pregnancy. I did a home birth and um, he just was not present for it. I could feel, um, but in the hospital, um, I went there for high blood pressure, which started with all of the stress I was going under, um, but they thought it was preeclampsia, but it wasn't, it was actually from the stress we later found out because um, in the hospital they used magnesium and everything to get my blood pressure down. Um, and the moment I, I had like a little panic attack about what was going on and it spiked right back up with the medicine and the nurse had come in and asked me what was wrong. Um, and I told her that my husband wanted a divorce and I didn't know what I was going to do with this new baby. Um, I told her that I always wanted our baby to have like a two, sorry, um, a two person home. And so I even like throwing out the pregnancy, um, thought that maybe it would be best if we adopted him out, um, which sounds crazy to me now, but that's kind of where I was because for me, like we both came from broken homes. And so, um, I just never wanted that for my children at all. And so at, we were just so at that point where I did not think anything was going to resolve. So that was probably the lowest moment. And then the nurse told me, she's like, you have to get it together for your kid, if anything. Um, and you don't need to take this medicine. You don't have to be in this hospital if you learn to just reduce your stress and uh, figure things out. And so that's what made me start realizing that I needed to, you know, get my emotions in check despite, you know, everything going on. So it's, that's, that's kind it's of a <laughs> lot. It's a lot, Izzy. Wow. That my heart breaks. This is how hopeless you felt about your marriage, your family, that you were thinking maybe my my child would be better off ad adopted somewhere else. I mean that and being in the hospital. Oh my gosh, this is stressful. What you're describing, heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So you decided you were going to try to get to manage your emotions better, but how would you do that? How did you do that? So I had a couple months prior had found your book. Um, we had started counseling maybe five months before our baby was born um, with marriage counseling. It, it was not good at all. It was really bad. Um, and then I had found your book through um, a Facebook group I was on. Um, and somebody was talking about their bad relationship and they gave them advice. And I was like, oh, I, I should look at this. And it probably back in uh, end of March, early April, and our baby was due in June. So I had a few months of like reading the book and learning the book. Um, but what was what was frustrating at that time was he was resistant to um, these skills at the time because I was using the skills to still control him. Like I was trying to control the outcome of, oh, okay, this has made everybody not get a divorce. So I'm going to use these skills so I don't get a divorce. Um, and really the hospital is kind of that turning point where I realized, you know, I, and I was like, we're probably going to get a divorce. And so I need to learn to make myself happy. Um, parts of these skills have helped me make myself happy. So I have to let go of control of the outcome of this. And so that's kind of how I got myself together. Wow. Okay, Izzy, I want to dive into that. That is super interesting because I think, I know for me, I just wanted to figure out how to make my husband act better. And that's, that's how the skills were born really. And so and it sounds like you were thinking along the same lines. Like I just need him to, to stay in this marriage and not divorce me and do, and maybe, um, give up the porn addiction and things like that. So, but you said, and, and that's kind of how you started out too, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. And then, but you came to a point where you thought, okay, um, my, I can't control the outcome of this. We might still get divorced, but I'm going to practice the skills anyway. Is that right? Yeah. I realized that it was, I had heard, heard a podcast and it made me realize that these skills were really for me and not for my husband. And so, yeah, it was more of like, how am I going to make myself happy? Because I can't live with this type of emotion anymore. 
Um, I was just so distraught for good reason, but it was just, it's just not livable to live in that type of like instability for so long. So I realized I needed to do something to make myself happy regardless of the situation. Wow. And all this is happening at this really, this high pressure crucible moment in the hospital that you were coming to this realization. So, um, someone else said uh, pain is a good teacher in a way, right? Pain kind of led you to this moment of surrender. Yeah, I did. So what did, what did you do from there? So from there, um, of the outcome and I started focusing on myself, which was something I had not done. So self-care, which is a word that I, I sometimes even still struggle with. I just, I have a hard time understanding what it is and when I should use it and everything, but I realized it's just any little thing that makes me happy. Um, and I realized I was so depleted in it, um, just by, I, I work in a helping profession within and I help my family. I give advice to all my friends and all this stuff. And I just never took care of myself. So for self-care for me, that was um, going to counseling, just one-on-one for myself and my um, previous traumas, not marriage counseling, because I realized it was a me problem. Um, I started doing things like going to dance class and like a couple weeks after once I was allowed to start dancing. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Not like that, just, right, at, right on the way home from the hospital. Yeah, not right on the way home. Um, and it, just trying to do things that made me happy. Like if I wanted to buy something, I bought it. I was like, you know what? At the time he was kind of, which is part of our problem too, was the finances, but I noticed he was spending a lot more. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to spend more. And so I just started doing things that I thought, I would enjoy calling friends since we are live away from most of our friends and family. Um, and then also getting together with friends. I made it a point to start having um, coffee dates with friends and not really. I used to revolve my schedule around my husband's schedule because I wanted all the time I possibly could with him since his job requires that he goes um, um, away for a couple of days, like 48 hours. And so. I wanted to protect our time that we had together. So, but in doing that, I was letting a lot of my wants and desires out the window. So I started doing that. Um, Other thing that I did um, was staying on my own page, which was letting go of that control. Um, And so, and part of that was, wasn't wanted to necessarily, but it was more because I just didn't care anymore about his life. Um, because of where we were, but it turned out helping because that was a huge point of why he was so unhappy. And I mean, I was to the point where like, I used to help him with his resume and job searching and like all these things. And so, um, I thought I was helping, but I was really just micromanaging like his whole life. I'd be like, Oh, why do you have to do this? Why do you have to hang out with them? Kind of all that stuff. And so that was a big piece. Um, and then the other piece, which felt really awkward because I, I was doing it wrong in the beginning, but was gratitude. So every night before bed, I would tell him three things that I was grateful for about him during that day. And then um, I started using the spouse fulfilling of something I didn't necessarily believe about him, which was that um, you're an honest and loyal husband. And so I just kept saying that to him. and. I later found out when we started talking more that it felt so uncomfortable for him because he felt like he had to say something back and he didn't want to. And so it really didn't start working. Well, I told him, no, I don't have an expectation that you say something nice back. I'm just genuinely telling you these things. So that's when that started working. But even there, that was showing the level of control that we had in that relationship. Oh, this is, I love about your stories that um, you're so accountable, you're so self-aware and you're like, oh, I was, I was doing this wrong or I was doing that wrong. And, and, you know, then, then things changed and you learned as you went along. Cause I think that's pretty common. And I think it can be so discouraging when you're starting out with the intimacy skills and you think these don't work in my situation. So how did you, 
how did you overcome that? Because it kind of feels like it wasn't wasn't working at first for you. Is that fair to say? Yeah, um, I just kept pushing through and I started getting little signs, I guess, that it was working. So uh, a couple of weeks after we had the baby, I wanted to go to the farmer's market and I was planning on myself. Originally, I would be like, hey, you come with me to the farmer's market, kind of making him come. And this time I just said, I'm going. And he was like, oh. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to take him. You can just chill here or whatever you want. He's like, well, can I come with you? And I was like, yeah, you can. And it was, weird. I didn't know why he wanted to come with me if he was like, not, he, I mean, this is to the point, like, I also forgot to mention my um, mom had passed away a couple months before I um, gave birth and like, he didn't even um, go out to the funeral. So it was really surprising that he was doing this to like, want to spend time with me. So there were a couple turning points like that. Um, he would say stuff like, is really hard on me like I don't actually want this um when he originally had said he was gonna move out it kept changing where it was like I'm gonna move out next month and it turned into well I'll stay here since you can't work um until maternity leave and then I'll move out and then it turned into his counselor told him that he should get a studio apartment and that um in order for us to have that full separation. And he said, but I'm not going to listen. I want to stay with you. Um, and with the baby so I can be there and help you out. And so there were little things like that, that really showed me, um, that, that things were turning up for the best. And when I did go back to work, um, he was planning on getting a futon and he didn't get the futon. He stayed in the bed. Um, it, it just felt like he had this, like, need to leave almost because he wanted to control the situation because I had always controlled the situation. And um, this was kind of his way of trying to do it his way. And um, he still kind of stopped and he, he, I guess, he just really wanted, I guess, that control. And so um, I was kind of giving it to him. And I even told him, I said, whatever you think is best, I'll do whatever you think is best. And that kind of, I think, started helping him um, make a choice that was more towards our marriage because I was putting that control in his hands. Wow. That must have been scary to say. So he's saying, I'm going to get a futon or I'm going to move out. And or and you were saying, OK, whatever you think. Yeah, I said that and I told him that, you know, I love you. I want to be and I I had always kind of put my desires as a controlling way of like, we can't get married or we can't get divorced and all of this stuff. And this time I said, I want to be married and I want you to be happy. Um, and he would just say, I know what you want. I know what you want. And I could just tell that he had this turmoil of wanting to please me and stay married, but having this problem with himself and what was going on that I had not known about during this whole time. So, wow. Well, that was incredibly courageous of you, Izzy, to say whatever you think when he's saying the thing that's most terrifying to you. Yeah, it was really challenging. And it, it kind of, um, from there, it started getting really good around like three months after, um, we had our baby and I went back to work and things started getting better and turning around. Um, he had started saying, I, I still need my space, but I want to stay together for now. And he started kind of putting requests, which it still wasn't great by any means, but I had really felt like we were in the clear. Um, cause he decided to go, um, he stopped going to his counselor that was giving him pretty bad advice. Like he told him that the reason he was looking at porn was because he wasn't attracted to me. And my counselor had pointed out to him, well, you had that problem way since your childhood. This isn't related to how you're feeling with your wife now. Um, and he just, I don't think he really was listening fully to the story or getting those probing questions. Um, he was just kind of advising on what he thought he knew. Um, and so I saw him just making these efforts. Um, however, this is kind of where like that second breakdown, I guess, happened um, is when I found out about the emotional affair. So I had 
suspicions about um, this girl because I had seen that they were following each other on this music app where you could follow playlists. And I was just genuinely curious. I was like, oh, who's this? Thinking it's a coworker, not thinking anything of it. And he got really defensive. And it was back in December um, when I got mad about the porn thing and had the um, just got feeling something was off. But I let it go throughout all those months because I was like, I have literally no basis. And this is where my control came in. I, I asked that he unfollow her because he had mentioned that he had a crush on her at one point. And so I was like, well, you, you just got to cut that out because that's what people tell you is just cut it out. Um, but I later found out in August that this thing continued throughout entire pregnancy. Um, and they were, they would text every day. Um, at one point she told him that she liked him and vice versa. And she had said, which I know the drill with this stuff, but she had said stuff to him to kind of gain his trust by like saying, um, like, I respect Izzy too much to kiss you, but I want to kiss you stuff like that. Uh Um, but he told me all of this uh, back in uh, actually no September. He told me all this in September. Um, and the one moment this all kind of came out because I had found a Snapchat of their messages and it, it, there wasn't anything. It was just like a friend thing. And he told me it's been over really since May, June, but we've just made a friendship. Uh, and I really, really wanted, I had that urge to say, you have cut this off like you can't stay friends with her um and he even said to the point he's like you know I even thought that you guys would be good friends because you'd be a good influence on her and he said that he realized through this emotional affair that um a lot of people are very toxic and people around in our we're in our mid-20s so the dating culture is very different from how like we live our life. Um, like we are each other's first loves and we stayed um, virgins until marriage and everything together. So it, he realized, I think through her experiences, cause she had a boyfriend at the time, how um, different the dating world is. And so he, he started telling me just how much he appreciated me through all of that. Um, and instead of me yelling and getting mad when he started disclosing all of these things that had happened, um, I just was vulnerable and I just cried and said, I'm just so, uh, didn't yell at him. I name him. Sorry. You just cried and you said, I'm just so mad. You're just so bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I had told him cause I wanted to honor my feelings. Um, but I didn't want my feelings to make the situation worse. And so by me saying that instead of him becoming defensive, he just held me and said, I know we're going to get through this. Like, I want to be with you. I've chose you. Um, and so it was just a huge turnaround. Um, it was really hard though, because it was like, I realized all these things that he was hanging out with. This one friend was actually with her and I mean, it was just to the point where he had went and comforted her when her friend had died. And I was like, my mom died and you weren't even there for me. So there was a lot of resentment um, towards him. And um, and I just realized, though, that I had to look past that because just knowing we were not in a good place um, and understanding where he was at, which he had said he was ready to leave me. Um, regardless of her, he just wanted out. And so there was nothing in his mind that he thought would fix this um, until I found the skills. And that's when he started realizing that things could be different in our relationship. Wow. Amazing. Um, It does sound, it sounds tremendously stressful. So when you talk about reacting with just um, you were crying and you were just saying, you're just so mad how do you think you would have reacted? That that sounds like you were reacting kind of like having had some experience with the skills because mm-hmm. it sounds like a pretty vulnerable reaction. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of putting my emotions on him or saying anything to attack him, it was really just, this is what I'm feeling. And 
letting myself feel that. Um, Pre-skills, I would bottle up my emotion and blow up like a week later kind of deal. And so, um, and then I would just kind of let him have it with everything and yell and be like, how could you do this kind of stuff like that. Um, And it just, it was also kind of one of those things where I didn't know about this, but like you can have um, relationship PTSD, I guess, kind of symptoms. And so with the porn and the lying, I just kept getting re-triggered every time I'd find something out. So it was just a really vicious cycle where I would blow up on him. He wouldn't feel safe to share with me. I would blow up and vice versa. And so it, it created this place where he either had to choose to lie to me or choose to be honest and deal with my emotional breakdown. So that's kind of the predicament I put time we had hard conversations. But you didn't know there was any other way to react besides blowing up, right? I mean, did you have any idea there was an alternative to doing that? No, that was a big part too, where his, his parents were divorced, but they never fought. And so he had never seen anyone fight before. And I came from a hot headed family where like, you're very direct and you tell people how you, so to me, I always kind of thought just couldn't handle fighting. Um, but really I was not fighting fair, I guess you could say. Um, and you know, it was, um, we were just, we were on total opposite ends of what we had seen in family dynamics. And to me, I thought, especially with his parents being divorced, I thought, well, if they never fought and they divorced, then you have to fight so that you can get your problems out. I didn't know that there could be a different. And your parents are divorced also though. Yeah. Um, but I was adopted. So, um, my birth parents were, and then my adopted parents were not, Oh, gotcha. but I had a real, it was like an inner family one. It's, it's a weird situation. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So you, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you, so you uh, were, you had this belief that, um, this, this fighting, the part of where you were fighting was actually better than trying to avoid those conversations because, um, because you had this evidence that that had ended his parents' marriage, this kind of stifling the feelings and not talking about it. Yeah. And I always mm-hmm. kind of felt like too, with the lying part, like, and he, he would say this too, that he had been taught to lie within his family. Um, and so just to keep face and like, it would help within the separation he lied at one parent or the other to um, just kind of mediate situations. And so there was that component too, where I was really blaming him for all of this because I thought this was everything he brought into the relationship. Yeah. Like you married a dishonest man because that yeah. was his, that was his previous training. Wow. But it sounds like your commitment was very strong to your marriage because you, it doesn't sound like I mean, I heard that you felt hopeless about it, but it doesn't sound like you ever gave up that it could, that you could make it into something better. Um, I would say yes and no. I, I had heard from a lot of people, like, um, my grandpa told me that he was gone and just like, was helping me get a plan to move back home. My one best friend, um, back home, she was, trying to tell me that it wasn't just an emotional affair because men don't have emotional affairs. And in her mind, she's like, he's sleeping with her, um, which I, I know is not true, but in her mind with her own experiences, that's what she felt. And so lots of people were told to get a divorce. Um, that'd be better off. And that, um, actually even his mom was helping me telling me to put money aside so that I could, um, support myself. So, I, I really, I had some doubts because of the influences outside of me, um, because I thought I was being, um, I, I felt like there was hope, but people around me didn't. And that, that brought me down. Yeah. So how did you get that strength? How did you find that, that hope, that commitment to, to stay the, you know, stay the course and try to fix it? I think part of it, well, a big part of it was God. And so for me, I'm a a pretty spiritual person. And I just knew that this was not the life that I wanted. Um, 
And when I realized that I could do something about it, that's what gave me the hope. So I had been praying um, prior to finding the book that I, I needed something to like heal our marriage. And then the book came along and I, there's that one quote that says like, when you pray for patience, God gives you, doesn't give you patience. He gives you the opportunity to have patience. And so that's kind of how I lived by it. I was like, this is my opportunity to have patience and really see this through. And, and if it didn't work out this way, I trusted that these skills at least would help me in a next relationship. But I still had hope that we would stay together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm impressed. I, I love your, um, I love that you clung to that hope and found that optimism. And it sounds like it was a self-improvement program for you in a way. Yeah. Oh yeah. It definitely was. I had no idea how many things, um, I was doing wrong. Um, and that was a big thing too. Like I did not understand what it meant to be quote unquote subordinate to your husband. Um, cause I'm a very independent woman. I'm, I succeed a lot career wise and I'm a go-getter. And so it was just so confusing to me, that understanding of being subordinate. Um, and then through these skills, I was like, oh, I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing this wrong. Um, every little thing in your, I read the empowered wife book. That's what after the podcast. And I realized you would say something like, um, telling him what to wear. And I would do that. Or like telling him how to, um, you know, put dishes in the dishwasher, just like little things, but they add up. And I realized that in, if I'm subordinate in the way of, um, respecting him in the way that he wants to be treated, I get a thousand times better treatment. And I just didn't understand that concept until really learning the skills and applying them. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I always knew I should be respectful, but I didn't really know how to be respectful. So I I totally relate to that. So what is your marriage like now? So now it's, it's a lot better. He, he said that, um, which just was a huge turning point. He said, you know, if it wasn't for the skills, we would not be together. And I just feel like we are a team now. Um, he said, he never felt like that. Um, one day I was like a little upset because you obviously have your bad days and everything. Um, oh, yeah. and he would, he reassured me. He said, look, we're, we used to like not be as physically intimate and that's my love language. And he's like, look, we have been the most physically intimate than we ever have in our entire relationship. Um, he's like, you have nothing to worry about. Um, he calls me sexy. He calls me beautiful, which is like crazy to me because like just a couple of months ago, he was saying he wasn't even attracted to me. Um, so wow. it's dramatically different. And he that wants turned to spend around fast. time with me. Yeah. 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 He wants to spend yeah. time with you. He wants to go to the farmer's market with you. Yeah. And even like <laughs> bath time yesterday, I was giving our baby a bath and he kept following me into all the rooms. And I was like, are you wanting to do this? Cause I was so confused. And he's like, I'm like, well, if you want to give him the bath, I'll go do the dishes. And I was like, or, and then I thought about it. Cause I heard this on a podcast. I was like, or do you just want to be with me? He's like, I just want to be here with you guys. And so I was like, okay, well, let's give bath time together. So it's just, he keeps saying stuff like, I just can't wait for our baby to be just a little bit older so we can do things together. And he says things like, I just want to focus on our family and our unit and just getting better. And so it's just a lot of, it's just more pleasant. Like it's great to be home. There's no fighting. The only time there's fighting is when I have fear and I start doubting things. And that's the only time. And it's not even a fight. It's more of like a I am a little upset and he can tell and he's like, what's wrong? Reassures wow. me. So it's, it's not even like arguing, which I didn't know was possible since our whole relationship was arguing. Wow. So, and you're, you're still a mere mortal woman. So once in a while you're going to get scared maybe. Right? Oh, yeah. That part, yeah, that's normal. And, but so how much less, like if we were, did it like a before and after, like how much fighting was there compared to how much there is now, like is it reduced by 20% or 50% or. Oh, I'd say like 90%. Like if you saw us when we first got married, 
like his brother would say we bickered all the time about stupid little things um and that was our relationship of like we were both trying to like be right and everything rather than being a team we were always against each other and now it's funny because that was actually one of our problems too where I didn't feel like he stood up for me and um his family and um now I I don't even have to say anything he'll look at me and he can already tell like that there has been a misstep and he stands up and as a team and we you know um I I don't have to say anything to his family he stands up for me which wow. is really, yeah and that, that was not a thing he ever did that must feel amazing. Well, uh, this is incredible. What a transformation is. Do you feel like divorce is off the table? Yes. So actually one day he um, came home from counseling. He started seeing my counselor individually as well. Um, and he came home and he said, I want to let you know that I'm committed to you. We have our problems to work out, but divorce is off the table and I just want to be with you. And so that was a huge turning point too, where I started so happy. Um, but I, I knew from that moment that that was the truth. And I realized that, you know, life is ever changing. So we're obviously going to have problems and have to work on things. It was nice to hear that he's committed to being with me. Oh, so nice. must have been music to your ears yeah, to have definitely. him say that. Um, and what about the porn addiction? Yeah, so that one's a little, you know, with addictions, it's, it's always a lifetime thing. And I had I learned through this that it, I had used to put myself um, in the addiction as an equation, I th- always kind of put my self worth in it and like, my appearance and just having low self esteem around it. Um, but and I, I realized I think it was in your book or a podcast that um, you had somebody consider that the porn might not actually be the problem and that's on their page. And so I decided that that was on his page and I was not going to bring it up to him. Um, My counselor had a different thought on that. She thought that I should be holding him accountable and helping him go to his meetings for it. Um, cause he had a 12 step program, but just something irked me about that. Like, I felt like that was still control. And so I had asked him before doing that. I said, you know, our counselor says this, but really with this empowered wife, which she knew I was doing, um, I said, I don't feel like I should do that. I said, I want to be there for you. Like, how can I support you? He's like, just be there for me. I'll tell you like what I need. So I, I don't know what it's like, but I had put our lack of physical intimacy and the attraction issues on the porn addiction and those are gone. So um, to me, it it doesn't matter. Like, obviously I care for him, but he even said, he said he used that as a coping mechanism for stress and I was causing a lot of stress. So now that we have less stress, I would assume it's lowered or decreased, but like I said, it's always an ongoing, um, addiction is always an ongoing thing, but I'm just there to support him because it's on his page. Just how like, you know, someone might have, you know, overeat or something and that's on their page. And it's not my responsibility to fix him, which I used to think it was. Yeah. Wow. I I love that. um, You got so clear on the role you wanted was not to be like his taskmaster around making sure he attends meetings or whatever it is you wanted to, you still wanted to be his wife and most of all his lover and not, not, not get entangled in that. It sounds like um, the, whatever you were doing before was maybe pushing him towards it more. And what yeah, I would tell now, him, it's like, yeah, it's completely it hands him. off. I used to tell him, I'd be like, are you going to go to your meeting tonight? Well, if you miss this meeting, you should go to an online meeting. Have you got a sponsor yet? Have you done the step work yet? Like I was just, I was sounded like a mom. So yeah. I'm not doing that. Anymore. You don't want to do that. You don't no. want that job anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, that might've been putting your foot on the accelerator instead of the brake. It sounds like yeah. before. Yeah. You know, yeah. You're getting a totally different response. So um, that's, that's so instructive, right? To anybody that's dealing with um, an addiction with their husband is so, I think it's just so enormously tempting to 
want to get in and try to control or tell him what to do or, you know, encourage him. And um, if it's coming from a place of fear, it can sometimes just completely backfire. Yeah. And one thing he said too, which I think this going with addiction, he said, um, because you changed, I want to change for our marriage too. So it's going to obviously take time, but that showed me that he is, he has the intention to change and I just have to trust that he's doing it his way. Um, and I think part of that is just learning different coping mechanisms. Cause for him, his addiction truly is his stress reliever and he's just never known another way to decompress. And it's just so habitual. So that was a huge moment that he said, like you change, so I'm going to change. Wow. That must yeah. felt so good. That's what an acknowledgement of all the work you did to become your best self. Yeah. Yeah. It was really nice to hear that. I was like, yeah. well, the, my, the wife mirror is real. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how, how do you think it's affected your baby? Um, It's affected him. I think really good. People always tell me he's just the happiest baby and he's so calm. Um, like for a baby, he barely cries. Uh, and I really think that's a testament to just the energy that's in our house. Like we are, we don't fight about anything with him. If he has a different way of doing something at home with the baby, I don't say anything. I let him do it his way. Even I use duct tape. I'm just keeping my mouth, um, quiet. <laughs> if, even though I want to say, Oh, you're putting the diaper on too tight or those yeah. jammies don't fit all of that. And I don't do that. And so I think because that tension's not there, um, he's just able to be happy and just helped us. I obviously some babies are just naturally that way, but I, I do think it's because there's not tension in our house anymore. That's awesome. And you must just feel so good about providing that kind of a home for your son, right? Here you thought you couldn't provide any home really um, for him. And now you have this, it sounds like a wonderful home, is he? Yeah. And I think it made him really, um, he's just, I. it's made us both better parents. And I realized that these skills are going to be so helpful when um, I'm going to raise him and, and um, he's going to raise him as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's dreamy, right? That's, that was your, that was your dream. That's what you wanted for your son. And now you were able to give him that, which is amazing. Yeah. So what, what's your tip for somebody who's maybe back where you were in the hospital thinking this is hopeless. Um, I'm, you know, he's going to leave. Um, and we fight all the time anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I better save some money. Like, you know, all the people were telling you and put that aside and get ready to leave. Uh, and she wants what you have now where it's, it's peaceful and he wants to be with you. And he tells you he wants to be a better man because you become a better wife. Um, what, what should she do? What's your best tip? I would say don't focus on the outcome. Just focus on the present moment and making yourself happy in that second that moment. Um, a big thing I just I still struggle with is anxiety of the future. And that I think is what causes, or going back in the past, but that's what causes that present moment to just not be pleasant. Um, and so just doing whatever you can to stay in that present moment and doing something to be mindful during that moment. Um, so self-care is a big one, I would say, even though it's like my least favorite. Um, but I would say that is a huge one. Even my husband will tell me, He's like, have you done your self-care today? Um, because he'll, he'll kind of keep me accountable in that way. Um, and that just shows how important it is because it does change your attitude. And so just focusing on whatever you can to be happy and not try and control the outcome because whatever the outcome is, you're going to be okay. Yeah, love that. And uh, what do you think you would say to Izzy if you could go back and tell her what you know now? Oh man, I would tell her, I would tell her that she needs to look in the mirror pointing fingers because there's probably a lot of fingers pointing back. Um, and I would, I would just say, don't be so afraid that I'm looking back now at our relationship and every problem we ever had was because I was afraid. So I would just say, don't be afraid and just 
choose to honor the moment. That that's what I would probably say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does seem like you have become uh, very courageous, really good at maybe feeling afraid, but not acting on it. Yeah. Yeah, I have. And that's a big, that's kind of my next step with everything is just working on being mindful. That's my new self-care thing is finding ways to stay in the present. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, Izzy, congratulations. This is a huge accomplishment. You've saved your family. Uh, So all three of you are in this um, strong family unit now as a result of these actions that you took, these brave steps that you took uh, to fix your marriage and to make it worth being in again, to make it so that you're, all three of you are happy in it. I just admire you so much for ending world divorce in the most significant way possible um, by finding the courage and the, and having the commitment uh, and the vulnerability to uh, work on yourself and show up to be your best self and therefore saving your family. So congratulations to you. Thank you so much. Ah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for sharing your amazing story with us. This has been very inspiring. Uh, and you're so young. I'm kind of envious that you have the skills so young in your marriage and you're able to apply them so beautifully. Um, but uh, really happy for you. Yeah, I feel really blessed that I got to um, learn these so early on in our marriage and so grateful for your podcast and your book. And I know a lot of people in my friend group are also very happy too, because they're all doing the skills now as well. So lots of people are happy. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, that's great to hear. Thanks so much, Izzy. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll share how chronic pain affects your marriage. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that John asked me if I heard about the fire at the Duraflame factory. And I said, no. And he said, it lasted about three hours. <laughs>